Thoughts, opinions, and general overall shades thrown on Hyatt 9 News are those of the individual speakers and not those of Hyatt 9 News, its audience, or its advertisers. The statements made do not constitute medical, legal, or financial advice. And for advice tailored to your specific situation, please consult with a licensed professional. Welcome to the Hyatt 9 News Hour, where you will hear from cannabis industry experts and professionals from around the country talk about important topics while shining light on global issues and discussing cannabis as it relates to politics, regulation and reform, data and technology, science, research and medicine, family and parenting, art, celebrities and entertainment, fitness, sports, mental health and wellness, and plant-based medicines and entheogenics. Together, we are building a stronger community, fighting the stigma and creating change. With your hosts, Jason Beck and Rico Lamite, joined by special industry expert correspondents from around the country and daily antics brought to you by Cannabis. Coming to you live every Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time and high noon on the East Coast. And thank you all for getting high at nine with us. Oh, yeah. Good morning, everybody. That's right. It is Thursday, March 28th, and today is National, that's right, Rico, you guessed it, Triglycerides Day. It's also National Black Forest Cake. (laughs) Yeah, it's the best forest. Uh, It's the best forest right there. Run, run, forest, run. It's also National Something on a Stick Day. What that something is, not too sure. And... (laughs) Oh, yes, you guys, it's everyone. It should be all of your guys' favorite day because it is National Weed Appreciation Day. Shout out to all the weeds out there. Yeah, shout out to all the Roundup going on. Thank you for joining. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for joining us and getting high at nine with us. It's also high noon on the East Coast. And please remember to like, share, and subscribe to us on all social media platforms. You can look down below on your screen to see exactly where we live on the internet. And we are live every Monday through Friday on YouTube, Rumble, Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and on our very own website at www.highatnine.news.com. But uh, coming coming in first today, coming in hot. That's right. We have the dope dad himself with the orange hat that he still is always trying to play off as red. That's right. The green screen's not working for you today, Rico, because your hat is still orange. I mean, oh, I'm taking it back to the game six back in Utah today. Let you, you let know what you, time it is. Let you take it to game six. That's right. It's none other than the dope dad himself rocking the orange hat. That's right. Mr. Rico Lameet. Thank you, Jason. All for the orange uh, No guy. amount of, what's that? Uh, all for the orange guy. You got your orange oh. hat on. I love it. Uh, yeah, okay. No <laughs> amount of uh, red slander <laughs> is going to uh, take me away from my joy of today's news. Oh, boy. Because <laughs> after 25 years in Congress, Utah Senator Mitt Romney announced that last summer, uh, last September, he will not be seeking re-election. While the majority of the uh, career politicians' time in office played out like any others, the last 12 years were rough. Losing to Barack Obama in the 2012 presidential election led to the normalization of extreme far-right conservative politics, and with it, the rise of Donald J. Trump. The former Republican golden boy that spent more than a decade outcasted and ridiculed by his peers, called a rhino for refusing to bend the knee to MAGA nation and a traitor for voting to impeach his own party's failed insurrectionist leader. That's old shit. Romney's just a few months left on his final term and to seal his political legacy and he will be damned if Americans only remember him to be the centrist loser that was too nice for his own good. And so he has officially kicked off the 2024 Romney's A Real Republican Farewell Tour. Phase one is all about realignment with modern conservative values. And what's more Republican these days than being an outspoken prohibitionist? Not much. Ain't that right, Jason? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Continue. Continue. Mitt Romney and two fellow Republican senators have teamed up with his longtime advisor on all things reefer madness, Kevin Sabet, in lobbying effort in a lobbying effort to sway the DEA's HHS rescheduling recommendation. 
arguing that doing so would put the U.S. out of compliance with international treaty obligations and make it harder for other countries' own drug enforcement uh, efforts, including for deadly narcotics like fentanyl. Oh, yes, he did. Marijuana Moments' Kyle Yeager reported that in a letter sent to DEA Administrator Ann Milgram on Wednesday, Senators Mitt Romney of Utah, James Risch of Idaho, and Pete Ricketts of Nebraska, all Republicans, said the agency would adhere to precedent and decline to move cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 under the Controlled Substances Act, as the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has advised. Here's what the letter by Senator, uh, by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee members said. Any effort to reschedule marijuana must be based on proven facts and scientific evidence, not the favored policy of a particular administration and account for our treaty obligations. Marijuana is, a con is controlled under the single convention, which is not surprising given its known dangers and health risks. And the United Nations International Narcotics Control Board um, has fiercely criticized efforts to legalize marijuana in other countries as a violation of the treaty. According to Yeager, the letter notes that Senate ratified the single convention that contains drug policy mandates for member states in, in a unanimous vote in 1967. And they pointed out that the DEA has previously cited international treaty obligations in denying past rescheduling petitions. Uh, they then listed a series of questions that they are asking the agency to answer. Does DEA still consider it necessary to keep marijuana in either Schedule 1 or Schedule 2 to comply with a single convention as it concluded under the Obama administration? Has the agency... Uh, as the agency has consulted with the has the agency consulted with the State Department regarding marijuana and any diplomatic implications of a rescheduling decision? Has the DEA consulted with key counter drug partner nations about our shared obligations under single convention and their views regarding a potential rescheduling by the United States? What impact would a potential failure by the United States to uphold its treaty obligations have on our ability to ensure other countries continue to enforce their own drug controls under the single convention, including for deadly narcotics like fentanyl. <laughs> Smart Approaches to Marijuana's head honcho, Kevin Sabet, said that his organization is grateful for Senator Romney's leadership on this critical issue of public health and safety for all Americans. And it is well documented that reclassifying marijuana as a Schedule Three drug would violate our international treaty obligations. The point, this points, uh, the, the points made by Senator Romney must be seriously reconsidered by the DEA and Department of Justice before any decision on rescheduling is finalized. While I'm unsure, Personally, I'm unsure that this particular series of tough questioning will influence the DEA's decision decision making process at all. I got to admit, it's a crafty move by money bag mittens. The last minute realignment with mainstream Republican values is the perfect way to make party faithfuls forget the past. And it will earn him the redemption that he deserves. As a former athlete, I see it was uh, as it is. Two seconds left on the clock. We'll call a timeout for an adjustment to close the game out with the dub. It's all about the finish, baby. I'm Rico Lambeat, the dopest dad on the street for Hide 9 News. What the rest of y'all think about Game 6, Prohibit Mitt? Is he MJ or is it Brian Russell all over again? What is going on with Mitt Romney? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I, I, I can totally oh my God. Get, 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 get behind this because <laughs> I, don't, I do not want cannabis to be rescheduled. So if I have to, uh, you know, they say the word, uh, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows. And so I can get behind Mitt Romney on, on, in, in regards to this. And if he wants to use this as the reason to, for justification for the DEA not to uh, reschedule cannabis, I, I'll, I'll get behind it. Whatever the reason they want to come up with, I'm fine with that. No, 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 Romney is a forever loser. He is. He and is. I agree I with like that to part, too. That, um, it doesn't matter because this isn't what the – what he should be doing is trying to open up dialogue to make it legitimately legal. Not to, talking about the schedule in it. The new conservative mind is not that of the old. No one is who with sticks up their butts. 
people who love marijuana, they understand that it has uh, a great deal amount of positive things that we can pull from it, not just the negative things, which is basically the smell and having the munchies that people think is negative. I don't, whatever. But, and as far as uh, Mitt Rodney, as far as um, conservatives concerned, um, the MAGA movement isn't about Republicans. The reason why he isn't accepted there is because the MAGA movement is against globalism. We are really against globalism and globalists, and he's a globalist. So he's not he going to fit globalist. in there anyway. And it just doesn't help him with the MAGA crowd either because most of us smoke pot. That part. That part. What do you got to say now, Rico? Your smirks. Y'all don't loser. Every Mitt day. will always be a loser. He's a loser. He's just a loser. Okay, you, you He's a loser. Me, what do I have to say? I, I, like, yeah, especially after all the uh, mainstream, all the mainstream Republicans cannot. They can't help but take the bait and go uh, and be diametrically opposed to what the Democrats are following in line on their end. You know what I think. Saying. You know what I think would be so, a good. So, hold on, hold on. Oh, you asked me oh, what I said. Let me all right, sorry, my bad. So in, instead of instead of offering you know, uh, 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 their own version and building upon what uh, the Democrats are seeming to do right now, they just have to say no because of the party of no. Yeah, rather than there is no Democrats. With, yeah, hold on, hold on. Rather than working with those folks on the other side, uh, uh, on the other side of the aisle, they just want to say no and they want to go as hard as they as they can go against it. Like, this isn't about like, oh, oh yeah, we want to uh, deschedule. It's not about like, oh, yeah, we think that this it should go this way. It's like straight up saying like, no, mm-hmm. that's but it. We definitely don't want anything to happen before this election because then it, then Biden gets the credit for it. So who do it now? Let the orange man, if he gets in, make any changes like you mean, this. You mean when he gets in? And, and there's plenty of young MAGA Republicans out there that have come out against cannabis. So I, I, I don't know where that fucking conversation went. Where, so. where, 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 which ones? Which ones are you talking about, Stone? Well, I have these Republican ideas. Uh, like, uh, what, uh, Matt what? Gates. Matt Gates I mean, is all about weed, so that that doesn't make any sense. I'm not around Matt Gates, Christy Nome, but there's plenty out there. Yeah, I I, I mean Christy Nome. Yeah, she's she, she's a hater. Uh, I'm I'm not. We don't know who Christy Nome is. Listen, we don't know who Christy Nome is, right? <laughs> and, she's, she's, and she, I'm concerned. I'm telling you, there is no Democrats and Republicans. There are a uniparty. And they are continuously having us believe that there is a side that represents us. They play good cop, bad cop when it benefits them. I can assure you that if Democrats wanted it legal, they had a full house and Senate with Barack Obama. They could have been made it legal if they wanted to. This is a, a game. This is a game. Well, it's your turn, my they turn. Joe Biden, Who too. points your point? I, I, so, That's so all it is, a game. My question, uh, my question is this. What is the Republican stance? What are their ideas? Not like uh, what has Obama done in the past. <laughs> Not like just the bro. I just told you no, there is no Republican Party. The bro, are doing. What, what are the positive ask ideas? Ask me what Donald Trump. Ask me what Donald Trump's plan is, and I can tell you what I know from his camp. But as far as Republicans is concerned, brother, I am famous for saying there are two dirty wings in the same dirty, dirty bird. This is my saying. I coined that. I don't the, believe that there is a Republican, the Republican Party. party. I, was, there is no Republican party. 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 You, I think you keep you keep misunderstanding me, brother. There is no Republican Party. This is a uniparty. These people, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer, are two peas in a the pod. They're brothers uh, under the skin. They belong to the same sorority. They go to the same schools, put their kids in the same schools. They have the sorority. same interests, and they are aligned in the same direction. Again, uh, there is no right. There is no left. The reason why Donald Trump is such a scary thing is because it not only changes globalism, but it shakes up the status quo. Look at currently right now, Mr. Sean Combs being used as a as a, as a diversion from the Nickelodeon thing. Mm-hmm. All I'm trying to say is, hold on. All I'm trying to say is that it ties into a great deal of everything because when you hear about the case, it is alleged that he has some very compromising photographs of politicians, very very famous CEOs, uh, record executives. But the politician thing is the most uh, interesting because who has he been aligned to other than the so-called Democrat Party? Stop it. One of the you can think of. So, 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 so here's the real question, though, when it comes to Mitt Romney, you guys. Um, because uh, cannabis companies are, are corporations. And so wouldn't they count as people, too? <laughs> they don't give a shit about that single convention from 61 until they want to use it as a hobby horse to ride. The world right now is violating that treaty every place. And the United States follows any treaty it goddamn well wants to, or it violates anyone it doesn't want to follow. So, you know, these are just games we're playing here. Sebet's got his head up his ass. 
a lump in his throat, his nose, and they're just going to continue to ride this hobby horse. I mean, is is Mitt going to change his magic underwear now and become something different than this, whatever from oh, you know Utah he's been all this long? I don't know. This is just bullshit. And they're they're scrambling now. You know, I don't. They're you know, going to get a win out of this last second three wow. pointer. As people just go hold their nose and go, oh, you're just so full of shit. Get out of my space. And while Mitt is changing his underwear, we're going to go to a commercial and we're going to be right back. Airball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man, that was weird. Hey, you, America. Do I look like Sean Connery? <laughs> Good morning, America. Saman Razani coming to you live from sunny Los Angeles, California with the one and only highest host, Mr. Jason Beck, smoking on the best weed in the world. Did you know that we have an audio-only version of our podcast? You can find it on Apple, Google, Amazon, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. No excuses in 2024. If you haven't checked us out, check it out now. And also, check out what The Prophet's doing in 2024. Oh, uh, yeah. Y'all know who's up next. It's the Hyatt 9 head honcho who is a little bit colorblind because he thinks that my hat is orange. It is. We're not even going to talk about even, that. Let, Come to the stage. Adam, can we put up a poll? His highest Republican in every single room, and he is known for smoking the best weed in the world. But um, I don't know. I don't know. He doesn't have any policies, so he must be a real Republican. Come to the oh, stage. God. Jason, back. You know, my, my policy is all about freedom and liberty, Rico. That's real, real cute. And Adam, hopefully we can put up a poll and ask ask all the audience if they think your hat is actually orange or if the, everyone is as colorblind as you and thinks that it's red. But nonetheless, here we go. You ready for this, Rico? DEA officials discuss marijuana scheduling timelines seeking to correct misinterpretations that decisions are made in a shroud of secrecy, you guys. That's right. A Drug Enforcement Administration DEA official says the agency wants to, in quotes, correct misinterpretations that its drug scheduling review process is done in a shroud of secrecy as it works to reach a final decision on possibly reclassifying marijuana. He also said it sometimes takes up to six months for the DEA to complete its analysis of, uh, of health officials' recommendations, which is just about how long it has been since the agency began its current cannabis assessment in the latest episode of the agency's in quotes prevention profiles take five series dea senior prevention program manager rich lucy spoke with dea pharmacologist buki Ibigigi Ib Ib uh, about the scheduling process and specifically how it relates to the ongoing cannabis review making the first time that officials with the agency have discussed its current analysis of marijuana schedule one status publicly in any depth in quotes i think it's important for people to again going back to correcting misinterpretations and really the issue of transparency and by us even doing this podcast just to help people understand the process, Lucy said. We don't want it to necessarily feel as if it's behind this shroud of secrecy, which I think then lends itself to this idea that it's a whole arbitrary process. Transparency has been key, has been a key concern for advocates and lawmakers, with DEA declining to say anything publicly beyond confirming that they've received recommendations from the U.S. Department of Human and Health Services to move marijuana from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3 of the Controlled Substances Act and are now carrying out their own review. That process is independent of the HHS review, Lucy stressed. And that's right, Ibigi says, uh, it's in the process. We've reached. Um, we've reached the HHS analysis and we're in the process of writing that recommendation on cannabis scheduling to DEA administrator Ann Milligram. Uh, in quotes, once that information is completed and that document is written, that eight factor document is written, is written, it's reviewed through our internal process, she said, referring to the multi step analysis the agency is contemplating on the efforts of, of cannabis. Ultimately, the administrator will make a decision to on where to place it, whether to change it or whether to remove it or whatever. 
Uh, Lucy also commented on the complexity of drug scheduling reviews and what it means in terms of timing. And quotes, right now it's a wait and see. HHS has done their part and now the DEA is doing doing its part, which is that eight-factor analysis. And that can take anywhere from three to six months sometimes, he said. I mean, it's not like we're going to be done in a week. It never happens that way, they said. While Lucy was speaking generally about the drug scheduling review process, that timeline is notable. HHS delivered its Schedule 3 recommendation to the DEA last August, meaning it's been more than six months now that the uh, drug agency has been conducting its own review, and there's significant pressure to complete its work expeditiously. The expectation is that once DEA completes its review, it will publish its decision in the Federal Register, after which point there will be a public comment period um, asked whether the those comments will play a role in the possibility of rescheduling. Uh, Ebigy said uh, that is unknown. That is an absolute unknown, he doubled down on. And in any case, she stressed earlier in the interview that it's important for the viewers to know that we read every single comment and we have to respond publicly. She also noted that after the public comment period, there's a possibility the agency will schedule a hearing, which it, which in in which individuals can request if they would like their opinions heard on a larger scale. Uh, Ebigy also uh, broadly defended uh, defended the scheduling review process, stressing that there is no arbit arbitrary and that everything the agency does must be legally defensible. One legal question that may be considered uh, that that may be considered concerns international treaty obligations and whether the U.S. would be out of compliance with the United Nations uh, single convention treaties if it moved cannabis to Schedule Three. An argument that several conservative lawmakers and prohibitionists have uh, have insisted DEA take into account despite differing opinions among legal experts. And that's what Rico just covered. Meanwhile, HHS Secretary Javier Bracera recently defended his agency rescheduling recommendation during a Senate committee hearing and also told the lobbyist Don Murphy that he should uh, pay DEA a visit and knock on their door for answers about the timing of their decision. Certain DA officials are reportedly resisting the Biden administration's rescheduling push, uh, disputing the HHS findings on marijuana safety profile and medical po uh, medical potential, according to unnamed sources who spoke with the Wall Street Journal. Well, 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 I wonder if that is uh, Kevin Sabet, but nonetheless, I'll wait and hear what you guys have to say about this. This is Jason Beck for the High at Nine News. What do y'all think about this, you guys? I have no credibility. Right. I can't tell you how many times uh, friends of mine who are attorneys litigated against them, friends of mine who are experts that went into trial against them, and they lied, coerced, cheated, stole, whatever they had to do to keep their position and to drag this shit out. Mm -hmm. And this has been happening since 1971 when they first got started. And now to say, oh, you know, that wolf that you see under the sheep's clothing is really not a wolf. We're, we've changed. We've changed our tune. Bullshit. The news inside that people are dragging their feet, of course they are. They don't want to do this. This is low-hanging fruit. And I told you before, the International Convention, they'll violate that if they want to. They don't give mm -hmm. two shits about that. So I just don't trust the DEA. And uh, I don't know, you know, this is six months. They'll drag this out until someone comes in with a boot up their ass and makes them make a decision. Or the court steps in and think, fixes it for us. Think that'll be a November surprise? God, who knows? <laughs> There's games being played everywhere here. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think about all this, Rochelle? Yeah, we are on the board. We are the pawns. Yeah, I would um, agree with that sentiment. Also, like Box Brown um, did a great piece in his Legalization Nation about this entire topic, and he argues that the UN treaties are powerless, which sounds like the uh, is the argument being made here as well um at least on our side I can't speak for the dea though I, I i agree with that that the u.n treaties are totally meaningless and totally useless I, I i totally agree with that i mean after all we do fund a majority of the united nations anyway this is, this is my opinion and not the opinion of my co-host or our fearless and the owners of this platform the dea are drug dealers Here we go. the dea yeah, allows the Mexican cartels to transport drugs in and throughout this country. They're also human sex traffickers. You can just look at it for what it is. You don't believe me? Go to Netflix. Look at the 
El Chapo's documentary, clearly he shows you why he had a downfall is because the DEA told him not to uh, make another factory, and he did it anyway. These people are a joke. Kamala Harris ran to a hip-hop uh, a legend, Joe, uh, Fat Joe. Shame on you, Joe. Shame on you, Joey. Shame on you. Shame on you. But using him as an outlet to talk about marijuana after she's locked up so many people for being in possession of marijuana. But trust me, they're putting this pressure on the DEA to get it, re, uh, get it rescheduled because they want to have the sense of victory coming towards the summertime because they need a push. Joe Biden is, is, is dead in the polls. And it doesn't matter even if they legalize it um, or deschedule it, it still is not going to change the fact that no one is going to go for the guy who's asleep all the time. Mm-hmm. Sleepy, sleepy Joe. What were you going to say, Dale? Oh, I, I just think that it's comical that this keeps coming up for talking points because, you know, I, I can, rem- I'm old enough to, and I am old as dirt, but I can remember when the DEA started this game and we were told, oh, we're just going to hold it in schedule one until we investigate it and we decide where to put it. That was 54 fucking years ago. Okay. It's like, nah, you know, this is a hobby horse they ride and Tony's on to something here because when you're involved in in uh, drug trafficking and enforcement against that, you make strange bedfellows. You end up being involved with drug trafficking and gun running and other kinds of shit because you're looking for evidence. And there's no bright line in there where you stop being a good guy and you become a bad guy. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing just makes me nauseous because this plant's never killed anybody. There's been more damage done by throwing people in jail and prosecuting them than was ever done by anybody smoking weed. I don't care what anybody tries to say. And that's the attention that nobody seems to want to pay attention to. Oh, it's the law and order thing and the convention. No, you throw people in prison for weed, you ruin their fucking life. Their family's life is ruined. And somebody smoking weed has never had those kind of problems on their family. Mm -hmm. It's got to be the outside coming in and enforcing against you for exercising your right to be happy. Mm-hmm. That's how I feel about it. It's just uh, bullshit. It's what it all is. I I, I agree. It's a whole whole big old bunch of bullshit. You know, that's right. Well, we're gonna keep this train rolling. We're gonna roll right into Mr. Attorney Dale Schaefer. He's, no game, baby. Oh, what's that, Rico? You say one big. This is a shell game. Oh yeah, <laughs> three card money, three card money, and hopefully it's a shell it, game. Man. Hopefully it's it doesn't go to schedule three, three. card money all day, bro. Like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, keeping it rolling. We're going to roll right into attorney at law, Mr. Dale Schaefer, who at one point in time did some time for a cannabis crime and is the founder of our model law practice. That's right. It is none other than attorney at law, Mr. Dale Schaefer. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my story today is uh, another chapter in the ongoing saga of Catalyst versus Glasshouse. Last time we talked about this, I think we were talking about uh, – um, Catalyst had a suit against the CDTFA, our tax people, because they were changing the rules ex mm-hmm. post facto after the game was played. Today's story involves um, a suit that was brought by Catalyst uh, against Glasshouse, claiming that they were involved in the black market. And um, the response that, uh, that I put into the, the chat today, or whatever you call this, you know, read this shit, it involves the response from um, Glasshouse to what Catalyst is trying to do with a civil suit. And I haven't read all the underlying complaints, but if you take a look at the, the motion that was filed, the history of this is that Catalyst went after the DCC for not enforcing laws and, and basically promoting the, <clears throat> the black market. They also sued the CDTFA over this tax bullshit and apparently lost a trial. And when they lost a trial, they appealed it, but they also filed a claim. This is Catalyst against Glasshouse claiming that they were part and parcel responsible for the black market. And they wanted the court to step in and issue an injunction against Glasshouse selling into the black market. What Glasshouse's response was is that, hold on for a second. Um, We have an entire uh, Administrative Procedure Act set of rules here. DCC is out overseeing licensed businesses. And Glasshouse's claim is that if they sold to uh, burner distros, they were licensed distributors 
No one's talking about whether they knew about this or conspiring to sell to get it on the block market. I don't. I think that may be another issue to deal with. Mm -hmm. But what Glasshouse has said is that, hold on, court should abstain from getting in the middle of this thing because the DCC is in the middle of these licensing issues and, and going into the black market. That's, that's an issue that the court should stay out of, let the administrative procedures of the DCC handle that. Okay. And the other <clears throat> argument they made is that under the unfair uh, competition law here in California, that in order to have standing, you have to actually connect any damages you have to something that the other party did. And they're having some trouble with that because even if Glass South was selling to the black market, they didn't allege that that caused Catalyst any specific harm. Okay. Generally, it, it, it harms everybody that's selling weed or, or moving it through California because the illicit market is, what, two-thirds, three-fourths of the market right now in California. Seven-eighths. Um, that's, a, that's a general description of an injury, but it's not a specific injury to Catalyst, okay? And the last thing that they said is that they have a safe harbor here. Uh, the underlying assumption is that um, Glasshouse, who's a licensed cultivator, sold to licensed distributors, and if down the line the distributor shifted to the black market, then again, that's a, that's a matter for the DCC because they were legally moving it through a market that's tracked and traced, and the track and trace has a big hole in it. The burners are selling to the black market through. But again, that's not... Uh, um, problem of glass house that's it's something for the dcc to try to deal with now <clears throat> i must say this is in the pleading stage and if you're not a geek at law of which most people aren't kind of nauseates most people these these motions are not based upon evidence they're based upon the face of the complaint that was filed so i'm not sure if the court's going to do this but they do have um a persuasive argument about equity here how would the court fashion an injunction against Glasshouse selling to a licensed distributor who then goes on to sell in the black market? It seems like the injunction should be against people who are selling in the black market or get off of this, leave it alone, and let the DCC handle it. Because an injunction is an equitable matter. And so they're looking at this and say the equities uh, sort of lean towards letting the DCC handle this. Now, this is just in the early phases here. It's supposed to have a trial in December, so we'll see how this goes. And again, there's no evidence behind this. They're, for the purpose of the motion, they assume everything that Catalyst said about them is true. That 60 to 80% of the what they sell goes to the black market and things like that. But you can't bring any evidence in right now to show they do that or they don't. And these are what we call non-speaking motions. You don't get to have evidence in them. So we'll see what Catalyst has to say in response to this, and then probably bring this up down the line. But uh, I'm going to throw it back at you guys. What do you think about uh, Glasshouse and Catalyst in this pissing match right now? You know, you know what I wonder, Dale? I wonder if they'll bring this up during their <laughs> quarterly earnings call today. Glasshouse has their quarterly earnings call today. I wonder if they're going to talk about this at all during that time. Well, it's well, yeah. Huh? Yeah, if there's litigation, you have to. I mean, these are things that you can't just poo-poo. And I, I don't know how deep they want to get into this with the SEC because there are layers of problems here that they could, you know, be up to their neck in. That, that's Glasshouse, I mean. Mm -hmm. Because if they're doing what's alleged here, not only is it a violation of the regulations, it takes you outside of the Rohrbacher far Mm -hmm. whatever iteration they have now in our McGinnis case out here that if you're violating the rules, okay, you're not protected by the spending prohibition from the federal government. So the federal government can move against you. And if they're doing what they're claiming here, and this is interstate transportation of a controlled substance in violation of the Controlled Substances Act. And, you know, I can tell you that that got me five years. They don't play around with this shit. Mm -hmm. You can end up in federal prison for quite some time. Yep. And it's all over weed. I mean, it's going to run people. It's all over weed. You know, this this is all basically nonsense. We should get out of the way and let the market control itself. But, of course, we know they're not going to do that because there's so many people that have things to gain or hang on to in the status quo. They don't want to let this go to a, a market that which is regular 
unregulated um, like alcohol. I mean, there are regulations, but it's not regulated like this. This is regulated like goddamn plutonium. We need to stop that. Mm -hmm. Very much so. What do you think about this, Rico? I think it's still weed for the people. Mm -hmm. Still weed for the people. All right, all right, fair enough. All day. Fair enough. You have any thoughts on this, on this stone? Oh, oh, yeah. You got to hit mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. My right when Dale was going through the last part of that story, my mouse died, and I was like, I'm stuck on mute. Please don't call me teach. Oh, God damn man. it. <laughs> damn. Weed for the people. It's still weed for the people. I'll go with Rico. My bad. Oh man. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I feel like Dale. I feel like this is just like 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 a small small update in a long continuing drawn out saga, and I find it interesting mm -hmm. that that they're not allowed to 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 comment on any on any, on any evidence throughout this proceeding it just seems like it's just we're just going to throw more mud this way and the other side's going to throw more mud this way and see whatever ends up ends up sticking in the long run after when they bring in the water hose they got they got to keep well, their, they got to keep their 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 side of the argument fresh right if if Elliot keeps on talking his shit like publicly they got to they got to say something well, the attempt is to stop this or nip it in the bud so they don't have to go into what we call the discovery phase. This is going to be a full-blown plant. There's no way that this that this is going to get nipped in the bud, bro. There's no way someone's yeah, well, putting this out when it's halfway done. That's why I'm saying this is a non-speaking motion. They, they're going to have to go into discovery, take depositions to people, and subpoena records. And, uh, you know, they may be able to cobble together even, a you know, claims that this is a scheme a corrupt scheme. I mean, there's Rico that's hanging out there based mm -hmm. upon some of these allegations. So I don't know where they're going to take this, but it's not going away today. There's some characters involved here who are pretty competitive. Okay. And they're button heads right now. And I just don't yeah. see this. Go they're spending money on attorneys. You know, it's the attorney full employment act, but this is two personalities that have locked horns and it's, it's not over yet. It's going to play out in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of ego being uh, thrown around right now, right, Dale? I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you. Oh, Not agreeable, highly competitive men. Watch oh, out. Oh, man. And on that, we're going to keep it rolling. We're going to roll right into a commercial, and we're going to be right back. The control tower from Highly Educated has perfected the dab. Utilizing the concept of thin film evaporation, you can waste none of it and taste all of it. The micro texture of the SE pillar increases nucleation at elevated temperatures. And with the tower propelling at 2600 RPMs, it's certainly the most efficient dab experience to date. The control tower from Highly Educated. All right, stop whatever you're doing. Make sure you hit that like button. I know we'll appreciate it. You'll appreciate it. And you too will even appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. And all of the stories that we cover on today's show, you can read directly on our website at www.hyatt9news.com. I'm Jason Beck, and this is Smoky Vanilla. And if you want to feel as good as I look, then you need to get yourself a stretch and smoke with Smoky Vanilla. That's right, baby. I'm Smoky Vanilla with my background in kinesiology. I'm a sports massage therapist and stretch coach. I focus mostly on athletes who have chronic pain or injury due to their sport or the legends of the chronic in the game, baby. Oh, Yee! yeah. You know what it is. We just stretched and now we're going to smoke because you know what it is. That's right. I love intuitively creating a session based on the individual I'm working with. We'll go through a few assessments, look at the past health history, injury, or anything that's still affecting you today, and create a customized session just for you. Let's go. Yee! Oh yeah, up next. Instead of taking the easy route, our next correspondent decided to take the high road. Coming out of the great purple state where Delta 8 <laughs> is never late. He likes real weed though. Coming to the stage, it's a fellow dope dad, my man Stone Slade. Thank you, Rico. Thank you, sir. Today, where are we? My story. Good morning, everyone. Start there. Today, my story is on a topic that's sparking. I wait this one. Am I muted? Oh, no. shit. I thought you said I was muted. 
Let me start that over. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Today, my story is on a topic that's sparking considerable debate, the role of cannabis in enhancing workouts. Amateur athletes, fitness enthusiasts, and even some pro athletes are increasingly turning to cannabis, not as a performance enhancer in the traditional sense, but as a means to alleviate pain, anxiety, and to make their fitness routines more enjoyable. Samantha O'Brien's experience is a case in point. Overwhelmed by anxiety during a boxing class, Samantha found solace and renewed vigor for consuming a after a consuming a cannabis gummy. This small dose transformed her experience, making her feel brighter, lighter, and able to enjoy her workouts. She's not alone. Alex Friedrich, a manager at a chiropractic clinic, echoes this sentiment saying, I appreciate what my body is capable of, what my body is doing, and the things I'm seeing around me, like running in a beautiful area on a pretty day. Now, this trend is not without science scientific backing, a 2019 study highlights that the top reasons for cannabis use before exercise are to enhance enjoyment, focus, and crucially for pain relief. Research uh, supports cannabis success, cannabis is success in alleviating chronic pain, a condition affecting about one in five people globally. Doctors like Alan Bell and DeAndre Psych acknowledged cannabis's role in facilitating the physical function and reducing movement fear, although they caution against considering it as a first line of treatment for pain. And I think it's a, for, it is the first line of treatment for pain instead of taking a pill. Anyway, the journey of Joanna Ziegler, an epidemiologist and former Olympic triathlete, is particularly telling. She was reluctant to use cannabis even after she flipped over her handlebars at the 2019 Ironman World Championship, breaking her collarbone and badly injuring her rib cage. But after years of chronic pain, she finally turned to Sweet Mary Jane, eventually finding a dosage that allowed her to exercise pain-free, leading her to establish the Canna Research Foundation. Now, on the mental health front, Morgan English's story states stands out, battling anxiety and a history of eating disorders. English discovered that cannabis helped her overcome gym-related anxiety, uh, leading her to create Stoned and Toned, a platform for offering workouts combining cardio and cannabis. Sounds like the only thing missing here, and this routine is a stretch and smoke from Smoky Vanilla. Now, Morgan said about consuming cannabis as part of her workout routine, I didn't have anxiety about what other people think of me at the at the gym. I was just very much in the zone. I was focused and it felt good to move my leg. Now, however, it's not all clear sailing. While cannabis can alleviate anxiety for some, it can exaggerate it for others. Clinical pathologist Jill Stoddard warns about potential dependence and advises seeking mental health support before resorting to cannabis. However, I think that's a little excessive uh, for someone looking to take a token workout. Dr. Ziegler also advises uh, using cannabis in familiar low-risk activities like yoga and stresses the importance of understanding uh, the personal responses to cannabis before incorporating it into a fitness routine. Now, one interesting study I found while I was researching this story was published last December in the Journal of Sports Medicine, and it talked about the runner's high, the, uh, the, that, that runners experience during their long runs. Natural pain-killing endorphins have long been credited with that famous runner's high. Newer research suggests that this is just a myth. Instead, naturally produced brain chemicals known as endogenous endogenous can cannabinoids are likely at play, kicking in after an extended period of exercise to produce euphoria and alertness. So by consuming CBD or THC cannabinoids, which bind to the same receptors as the cannabinoids our brain makes naturally, athletes might actually be able to tap into that high with a shorter workout or enhance it during a longer one. Now, some fitness enthusiasts who combine cannabis with exercise also often use uh, journals or apps like Tetragram to track their con consumption and its effects on their workouts. As for my personal experience, I've been incorporating cannabis into my daily activities, including workouts since my teenage years. It has significantly enhanced my, enhanced my experiences in sports and fitness, making me a proponent of its benefits. However, I respectfully disagree with the uh, recommendation to consult physicians before mixing cannabis with workouts. In my view, many medical professionals lack the su uh, sufficient education on cannabis to provide informed guidance. So obviously, if you've never smoked cannabis before, then maybe it's a good idea to take a toke, see how it makes you feel, start slow, and remember, everyone's experience with cannabis is unique. I'm Stone Slade, and thank you for getting high at nine with me. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I agree with you, Stone. You agree with that? Uh, I mean, um, I, I don't know the last time. I mean, even when I was a D1 athlete, 
our doctors told us to do a bunch of stuff that uh, was detrimental to our bodies years later. <laughs> That's a great point, Keeping Rico. It a buck. That's a Keeping really it great a buck. point. My body's still broken, and I didn't even make it to the NFL. So um, the way that I work out and uh, will continue to work out, uh, and I, I will not be consulting with any doctor before I do that. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I feel like... You know, he, he, go ahead. He, yeah, he said, I, I train. Uh, I'm in the gym five days a week, and four days of the week, I'm in the gym two times a day. I box. I have a sprained knee now. And literally, I would rather smoke all of the best weed that I can get my hands on than contact any doctor on X ray to see how bad the damage is. I would just rather get stoned. Like, I don't trust a doctor with anything. I trust marijuana. Mm -hmm. You should too. Yes. It sounds like um, somebody's putting that out there to get that, collect that $50 copay just for asking if I should if it's okay to smoke weed before I right, work out. Right on. I right mean, on. I, I thought, I um, thought it Tony. Was... Yeah. I was going to ask you, Tony, if, if you are, are, you're doing combat sports, uh, does it not slow down like your reaction? Like that's the one thing that I would have, I, I never, Yo, have you know what I do is make smoke. You, you, before I, I hit on, think uh, that on the football field, bro, have you not seen the Mike Tyson the training training videos? No, nah, no, no, I get high, bro. But the impact is more significant when you high. So I, I'm not, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to smoke at all until after I hit the gym. So after 4 p.m. today, then that's when I can smoke. But before I go, I don't yeah. smoke before I go to go exercise, whether it's weight training or whether it's boxing. Because if you get popped in your head and you're high, you feel it significantly. Me more than <laughs> you're not. I'm saying that's, that's the you most, get hit in the, the face and you're high. You, you feel it. <laughs> you <be> all emotional. <laughs> like, really, bro? Really? <laughs> yeah, you start. You, you like, start. You start. Me, they, might, they, might, they, might, yeah, they might not even hit you as hard as you think they hit you, but it's just like, wow, oh. Man, you taking this too serious? <laughs> I, I know, I know. You know, I don't mean to trigger. I don't mean to trigger anybody because I, I know we are uh, the last couple of times we brought this person up, people got upset. But um, you know, Mike Tyson, he said that he did microdose mushrooms before he uh, did the exhibition with uh, Roy Jones, and um, I'm glad he did. You know, uh, I, I don't know, man. Like he's he's about to fight. Uh, was it Logan or Jake Paul, whatever? He's Jake one Paul. of them Paul boys. He's about to fight mm -hmm. him. Like, he might get knocked the fuck out. This boy is 25 years old. Bro, have you seen his <laughs> training videos, bro? Have you seen this yeah. guy is looking better than, Dude, he, like, than he did in the 80s right Instagram. now? Instagram. You know how many millionaires we see on Instagram? You believe all of them? Yeah, bro. I'm just that, saying. That is, listen, I, I, I do this. That is a montage. Being able to keep up that level of intensity for round, eight rounds, ten rounds is not normally even known for Mike Tyson. I love him. He's a legend. I don't want to see him do this with this young man. Um, but they are wearing headgear and 16 ounce gloves. So, no, it's going to be hard to knock out Mike with headgear and 16 ounce gloves. It's just going to be hard to knock out Mike with 16 ounce gloves and headgear. I, I do think that Mike stands a chance. To make this a fair fight, come on. Mike Tyson yeah. should have to smoke his Mike Tyson uh, cannabis on the way to the ring, puffing, puffing, go through the first Logan brother, and then knock out the second Logan brother. I think this is not going to be a contest. We're going to see the young man out. Really? Yeah, God forbid. Yeah, God, God forbid we see any casualties like uh, in the ring or anything. But this dude's 25 years old. If Mike Tyson, at 57 years old, is juiced up and uh, the Jake or Logan Paul, I don't know which one he's fighting. I think it's Jake Paul, but uh, Jake Paul is juiced up. Like one of them can, their heart can explode while they're in the ring. The other one <laughs> can get juiced up tomorrow, get juiced up the day after, and <laughs> keep on going. Like, I think this is, a, if if it is a real fight, it is not fixed. Like, uh, this might be the end of Iron Mike. But 16 ounce gloves and headgear. It's not a real fight, it's an exhibition. Oh, there was no headgear. 16 ounce gloves. 16 ounce gloves and they're wearing headgear. It's the only Jake Paul. 16 ounce gloves and headgear. <laughs> if they're wearing headgear, I'm kind of disappointed. I don't know, man. I, I, I don't know. Like, like you said, but I, once upon a time last year, I believe, I saw a Instagram video of Jason Beck running a marathon with weed in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> I do not believe everything I see on Instagram. I mean, uh, hey, you know, we make things happen, bro. We make things happen. Uh, but on that, we, we got to keep this thing rolling. We're going to roll right into a commercial. We're going to be right back. Get ready for the return of the shit show to Los Angeles. Returning Friday, May 3rd. 
7 p.m. to midnight at a brand new venue. Comedy sets by comedians such as Demi York, Lindsay Ames, Alyssa Phillips, Chris Thayer, Josh Shakespeare, Fumi Abi, Jay Snow, Brent Weinbach, Chris Kelly, and hosted by none other than Abdullah Saeed. So head over to www.cloudmedia.partners now to get your tickets, and we'll see you there. Ah, uh, yes, coming up next. That's right. She's a Lego queen and bride to be. That's right. And she's also the editor of Green State Magazine. That's right. It's none other than Miss Rochelle Gordon. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate that. I'm looking forward to seeing some of you guys at the Women's Canada Awards this weekend and maybe coming into the office for a live stream on oh, Monday. Yeah. Come down to Mar-a-Lago. So yes. That would be amazing. I, my story this week, um, live from Green State, could pot save San Francisco? SF Weed Week seeks to revitalize the city. So... As we all know, the Bay Area has long been an epicenter of cannabis culture. But San Francisco has been getting a little bit of a bad rap as of late. From a pandemic-induced economic downturn to a rise in crime, people have left the cities in droves. But could pot bring them back? If you ask veteran cannabis journalist and senior Leafly editor David Downs, the answer is a resounding yes. The creator of the upcoming SF Weed Week happening April 13th through the 19th, Downs is planning a multi-day experience that will see consumers, cultivators, and industry professionals traverse the city to celebrate all things cannabis. Much like Restaurant Week or Beer Week, SF Weed Week features some of California's top growers and brands showcasing their latest and greatest at iconic consumption lounges and dispensaries. From exclusive product drops to an art exhibit celebrating weed packaging, activities span the vertical and the city of San Francisco itself. Quote, the city is 36% empty downtown from a commercial square footage rental perspective, David Downs told Green State. My vision is a thriving and exemplary city of San Francisco, cannabis industry, and culture. Downs was inspired to create SF Weed Week after reminiscing about record release shows at the famed Amoeba Records. Legions of loyal fans would line the streets, waiting to catch a glimpse of their favorite artists before securing a copy of their newest drops. It's a vibe Downs hopes to recreate for the cannabis community. Quote to me, weed growers are rock stars and strains are celebrities. I just want to give these strain releases the same rock star treatment, unquote. There's a number of confirmed cultivators and breeders joining the uh, fray from Cypher Genetics, Uncle Dad Vibes, Compound Genetics, Sonoma Hills Farms, which, by the way, I am hosting that talk on April 15th at Spark. Come on down. Uh, Fig Farm, Sense, Moon Made Farms, a whole bunch of others. The full lineup and schedule is available on sfweedweek.com. The venerable Tour de Force showcases cannabis culture in a way that's never been done before. Attendees will visit a wide range of weed venues, including Mission Cannabis Club, Meadow HQ, Spark on Polk, that's with me, Mo Greens, and many more. And after interacting with their favorite brands, SF Weed Week guests will have the chance to pre-order exclusive drops that are on display, a somewhat new concept for the California cannabis industry. Downs hopes the idea will stick and provide an economic stimulus to producers and retailers alike with the goal of bringing Weed Week to other cities across the country. Another unique aspect of SF Weed Week is the Get to the Bag Cannabis Mylar Exhibition and Retrospective at Miris Gallery and Art Bar. The first of its kind exhibition features over 400 iconic Mylar bags from more than 50 brands from both regulated and traditional markets, representing millions of dollars in IP. Opening night celebrations are on April 5th. The show runs through the 23rd. Make sure to go out and catch that if you are in the Bay. And the weed packaging game has evolved considerably since back in the day when buds were sold in nondescript baggies. The Mylars of today enable producers to tell their brand story, express their ethos, and catch consumers' eye. Quote, what I learned programming this is that the cannabis Mylar bag is an extremely active, aesthetically refined corner of the art world, David said, adding visitors should expect a rather pungent exhibit. It's a mirror into the cannabis culture because bag makers will tell you they're trying to please consumers and consumers are clamoring for variety in their bag designs and art, even if the weed inside is the same. 
And with the official Hippie Hill event canceled in Golden Gate Park this year, anticipation is high for SF Weed Week, no pun intended. According to a news release from San Francisco city officials, cannabis fans should direct their attention to the inaugural week-long fest. And while locals will likely lament the loss of Hippie Hill 2024, the potential for SF Weed Week to bring desperately needed business to San Francisco is the silver lining. I want to put the bat signal out for everybody to come to downtown San Francisco, Down said. So, what do you guys think? A Mylar art exhibit, exclusive drops, pre-orders? Are you guys going to come up to Weed Week? Tell me, are you excited? And are you going to come see me at Spark on April 15th? Let me know. Man. So they really think that this is going to revitalize San Francisco? I think his point, and David and I talked about this, I think the point is like there um, are opportunities in downtown. He was telling me that that gallery that they're having the exhibit at was wide open. So why not book events in the city, bring people back to the city, celebrate the city, um, and spend some money down there too? I'm not Northern mad. California holds a special place in my heart. That's where I started my early beginnings up in San Rafael before we moved to Texas. I love this uh, for for cannabis. I love this for the cannabis industry. But that this is, I mean, that's this isn't what's wrong with San Francisco. It's the smashing grabs and the, <laughs> yeah. the sidewalk. So I love it for I love it for weed. Uh, I won't be attending. I'm too far. But man, yeah, there's a lot wrong with San Francisco that doesn't involve cannabis. Are they going to have the zombie killer uh, security company outside? Does that come with you rent the building? <laughs> I would sure hope so. I, I mean, it should out there if you're gonna be renting it and having. Get that guy space. from the yeah. Walking Dead with the with the red mm -hmm. uh, scarf, whatever his exactly. name is. Exactly, <laughs> exactly that guy. Uh, uh, jo uh, Jason thought it was an orange scarf. Oh, <laughs> this should have been, been better if it was orange. It would have been better if it was orange. Well, I I hope David pulls off bringing a lot of people in the city. But mm -hmm. the first stat you gave, a third of the retail space downtown's empty is the big problem you're just not going to get over by bringing people in for a week to smoke weed. Um, retailers are leaving. The cost of living there is just unbelievably high. And, I mean, you're not going to fix that by coming to smoke and weed because people are going to come from the outside, drop some money, and then leave. I just didn't fill the retail space. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope this works, and if I get a chance, I'll get over there because I'm over in the Sacramento area. And, and Rochelle, I'd love to come in and chat with you if I can work this out. Okay, I'm an old man with a bad back, so traveling makes me grumpy. But I think we can try to work something out. Okay, that's all that makes you hey, grumpy, huh, Dale? No, no, a lot of things. <laughs> can idiots in the world make me grumpy, and they're all and, over the damn place. And that he pits and, up a uh, Make sure that you get uh, Rochelle. Make sure that you get anything that you need me to promote on X or on Twitter to Jason, so I can go ahead and, and get that out for you to try to help as much as I possibly can. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for, for, for sharing. Yeah, we're excited. I mean, I David invited me to be a part of it a little while ago. I think it's a cool story. And I think with Hippie Hill, the official Hippie Hill anyways, being canceled, um, it's an interesting opportunity. Do I think that people are still going to show up and get high at Hippie Hill uh, without any sort of <laughs> thing going on? I do. <laughs> so basically, they're just taking this as an opportunity to migrate everybody from an outdoor venue to an indoor venue. Yeah, but I think, but the this was happening and planned way before they said that Hippie Hill officially wasn't happening. That news literally just broke. So mm -hmm. yes, we covered um, that yesterday. Uh, 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 Rochelle, I'm, I'm glad you covered this story because I, I covered the the Hippie Hill one yesterday. And um, do you think that some folks that were organizing Hippie Hill um, are blaming? Uh, this one uh, for siphoning off some of the uh, the potential sponsor money. I think that's a fair question. I don't know the answer to that. I have I heard somebody else make that argument as well. But looking at who I think sponsored and was involved in Hippie Hill before, it was a lot of different brands and are involved right. uh, in the Weed Week. So do I think that there could have been some overlap? Yes. But do I think that some of the big players who maybe formerly sponsored Hippie Hill are just out completely? I think that's right. probably more indicative of the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh I just want I just want folks to support each other in this, you know. Um, uh, uh, Pre-COVID, that's all I did was events, event production, and I try to big up everybody just trying to do anything right now, and you know, support your people, man. We can't have 
we, we can't have these outside entities, you know, coming in and just like drowning us out with a bunch of negativity and, um, yeah, support events and support our people that you care about do a throw on events too. Period. Absolutely. We're all on the same team. Mm -hmm. Yes. Come on out. Yes, indeed. There we go. You ready, Rico? We got to get out of San Francisco before the zombies come and get us. <laughs> we got plenty of zombies here in the South Bay, Los Angeles, too, man. <laughs> uh, coming up next, <laughs> we have the most loved and hated and most feared black and Latin man in America. The man who was first to call out Puff Daddy before anybody else thought it was cool. <laughs> the man <laughs> who's more conservative than any body online if you see him on instagram or any other social network y'all know who it is antoine tony montega tucker thank Come you my screen. brother man that was such a amazing introduction thank you all the respect back, in the world from rico the meat man this is my brother and his hat is red jason it's red no, it's clearly it's, it's orange it's red. stop it look at the background it's there's orange. a red thing behind you guys his hat is just as red as that red strip going behind you guys so i don't even say the red strip is more orange than my hat <laughs> possibly so your, your hat is really red though it's red it's red i mean i mean this just proves my point because if um, you look at the if you look at the poll like 70 percent said said uh said, said that it was red so that just proves that uh that a majority of men are colorblind it also proves uh, that uh, know, no biden you know, won we, in 2020 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just saying <laughs> no it doesn't let's just go saying. both wrong <laughs> <clears throat> missouri strips marijuana licenses connected to a company accused of predatory behavior this story is uh sent to us by our fearless leader jason beck but it was written by uh let me see the person's name is asin bayless uh this came from the kansas city star missouri's health department on wednesday stripped two converted uh marijuana micro licenses tied to an out-of-state company that has been accused of predatory practices and had listed the licenses for resale the two micro licenses awarded to Sheshore Rhythm LLC and Arnold Near Street Luis and Frankenstein Enemy LLC in Columbia were among the nine licenses. She didn't even have a license with a name like that. Were among the nine licenses the state agency revoked for not being eligible for program for a program aimed uh, at helping small and minority businesses break into the lucrative marijuana market. The Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services announced Wednesday that it had revoked nine of the 48 licenses it had awarded in October after previously questioning the owner's elig uh, eligibility for the program in December. Questions regarding the predatory behavior in the program designed to help marginalized communities have cast a cloud over the state's marijuana industry for months. One license was stripped earlier this month because the owner had a felony offense that disqualified the owner from the program. The state revoked the remaining eight licenses due to numerous violations, including providing false or misleading information to the state. Throughout the application process, the owners of those eight revoked licenses had limited to no knowledge of agreements they had signed onto for the licenses and in some cases did not know the person who applied for the license on their behalf. The state agency said in a news release, Canna zoned MLS, a Michigan-based marijuana real estate company, had listed two of the, no, of the now stripped micro licenses for sale in October. The star previously reported Jeffrey Udema, uh, the company owner, I hope I said your name correctly, is uh, listed as the main contact for the 104 for 104 of the more than 1,000 micro uh, marijuana micro uh, license applications submitted to the state record show. Yatoma's company had come under fire for offering to pay eligible people to enter lottery award winning licenses for underserved groups in Missouri. It looked Illinois and Maryland, the Star, uh, Missouri Independent, and the Chicago Sun Times previously reported. The company's tactics, as well as its attempt to sell two licenses in Missouri, has sparked outrage from some lawmakers, including from Senator Carla May, you know, uh, uh, St. Louis Democrat, and a candidate for United States Senate, who in October 
letter a letter to who in October's letter to the DHSS demanded an investigation. Amy Moore, the director of the agency division of cannabis regulation, in a statement appeared to confirm that some of the licenses were stripped due to predatory practices. While owning and operating a license may include contracting for management services or consulting services, the lack of knowledge, control, agency, or decision making demonstrated by the individuals who uh, information was used to meet eligibility. Ah, eligibility does not meet even the more uh, generous implications of owning and operating a business, Moore said in the statement. An attorney for Canazone MLS did not immediately respond to a request for comment on top of the two uh, connected to Canazone MLS. The licenses that were stripped were tied to cannabis business advisors in Arizona-based consulting firm Maxim Cult. The president and parts owner of the company is listed as the main contract, a contact for six of the nine revoked licenses. One of the licenses connected to cannabis businesses, business advertisers, Putluck, THC LLC, applied to start a marijuana dispensary in um, Kansas City, but was not registered as a business in Missouri. The star previously reported the company registered with the state 12 days after the star's report, listing its home state in Arizona. Record show. Cut did not immediately respond to requests for a comment on Monday. The final micro license that the department revoked was awarded to Higher Love KC LLC, which applied to start a marijuana wholesale or cultivation facility in Kansas City. The company did not respond to an email on Monday. The state in December the state in December had initially questioned the eligibility of eleven licenses, but said on Wednesday that two of those license holders had demonstrated that they were owned by people who met the criteria for the program. Missouri in October awarded forty eight marijuana micro licenses divided across the state's eight congressional districts districts after the agency conducted a random lottery. One of the rules for the program required applicants to apply for and obtain only one micro license to operate a marijuana facility. A uh, Joplin man was denied a refund on his $1,500 application fee for violating this rule. The program was designed to help lower income individuals and minority groups break into the market, which has been demonstrated by a large, which has been dominated by large companies. Applicants had to meet one of several requirements, including having Net worth less than twenty five or uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, or having a prior marijuana related charge. You guys out there, tell me what you guys think. Is it fair that people were able to pay people or ask people to fill out mm-hmm. lotteries so they can then take the licenses from these people and have it in name? Resplit the trap seems to keep winning, and the people in the corporate <laughs> keep trying to invent a trap. Tell me what you guys think out there. This ain't the first time I've heard that, Tony. Right. And as a matter of fact, I've negotiated some agreements with people that I'll call them a straw man or a straw woman or a mm-hmm. straw person that stands there and meets the minority requirements or the whatever their local equity requirements are. They get paid cash to stand there, and then if they get a license, they get paid cash to go away. It ain't brand new. And I, I know of multiple situations where people who have felonies we're never going to be able to allow to own these or to own, to manage or direct them are uh, using straw men to own these licenses and they're in the backgrounds pulling the strings. It's, it's rampant. Mm. And do people think that, Oh, this is a, this is a one-off. No people with money come in, find the shoehorns to get them in and they'll give you what they have to, to get you in and then to get you out. And then they, they run off with a license and you know, it's, it's, it's pretty common in the industry. Mm. I wish it wasn't, but it is. It is pretty. You know, I ain't gonna lie, man. M- Missouri has been a pleasant surprise. <laughs> like everything from the success of their rollout uh, to actually taking action towards, uh, um, you know, punishing folks that are uh, being predatory and everything. Like I-, I did not expect like Missouri to be, you know, like leading the way in a lot of different lanes. You know, and people are actually uh, making money in Missouri them. too. Like yeah, they have a healthy Missouri. market. That's what I'm saying, man. Like, they've they've been a very pleasant surprise. Mm-hmm. Like, I was not expecting them to be as successful, like on as many fronts. Obviously, they they still have um, uh, their issues, like a lot of other people do. But um, 
Yeah, Missouri's uh, they all right, man. They doing all right. Are you saying what I've seen? Are you sorry? Are you saying that you support uh, Missouri does it better? <laughs> They're educatable. <laughs> they can watch how the industry's screwing up around the country. And maybe learn something. Because there are some ways to you know thwart this, but you know they bring yeah. attorneys in and look for the loopholes, mm -hmm. and then they dive in the loopholes, and you know. You, you, then you got to catch. It's the nature of the beast here. John Hancock was the most notorious smuggler in the colonies, mm -hmm. and he signed his yep. name the biggest to tell the king, "Fuck you, <laughs> we're going to break Brandy. these rules. Go ahead, try to enforce them. Mm -hmm. It's in our DNA." I see. This is why uh, I don't see why Donald Trump's favorite president was not John. Uh, John, uh, was John Hancock a president? He was, was he? Right? No. Like, I don't know. No. No. Yeah. No. Uh, nah, he was the man. Yeah. yeah. He was into making money. Yeah. He was the man. He was the man. He was. Yeah, he was, yeah he was, that's branding before branding was even a really big thing. So, you know, whatever. the first brander. <laughs> yeah. I ain't right. paying your stink and C tax, your T tax. Let's go. Fuck you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm all for it, man. But yeah, shout out to Missouri, man. <laughs> I, like, I like, I like hearing, you know, good news like this. And, um, especially when it comes to emerging market states that are not following California's lead <laughs> right into the pit mm -hmm. of despair that we've been in. Well, so, I mean, that's, that's, all, that's all of California. That's not even just cannabis. That's all of California. It's all bad, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see, see, that's what I'm saying. I, 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 can't, I got no, I got, I got yeah, no, I got exactly. no, uh, the response. Ain't no comeback for that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I got no comeback, man. There's been a, a steady decline. Mm -hmm. And mark my <laughs> words, like, New York City, even though it's horrible, is not going to let itself turn into California. Watch. Watch how they vote for Trump this election cycle. Oh, boy. Here oh, we go. God. Here we Always go. Back. Always, <laughs> back. Always back to that. Yo, in New York right now, yeah, it's people checking comments? people's temperature. They really, like, I'm dead serious. They really, in New York right now, they're really checking people's temperature. Let me tell you something. Black people are not playing in New York. They, I swear, if I'm lying, I'm, if my little brother, if I, if he you watching, lie, If you're lying, you die. Listen, I will have him on next Thursday, and he will tell you himself. It's people checking even his temperature, like, yo, you Republican or Democrat? He'd be like, I'm Republican. I, I'm telling you right now in New York. There are people checking your temperature. They have they have they a political, out you the about political to vote tap in. They're about checks? to get you up out of there. Oh, um, man. Uh, Rochelle, uh, Rochelle, what are your thoughts on Missouri, please? <laughs> um, well, I'm not going to front. I couldn't understand half of what Tony said um, due to lag. But I will say that I have been impressed by the Missouri market. I do feel like the Midwest in general is underrated. Michigan's killing it. Yeah. Minnesota will when we're eventually on track. So all of you guys that are sleeping on the Midwest, mm, pay attention. Midwest, yeah, miss in the game, man. Ohio up next. Mm -hmm. We'll see what those tenths do. <laughs> anything else? Anybody else want to chime in? What about you, Stone? You got anything to say about misery? Hey, Show Me State's been showing out. I like it. Like my buddy Brandon Jones up there is always talking about how good things are going, man. So I mean, so far, so good. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Yeah. Brandon. <laughs> Dark Brandon. Dark Brandon. Uh, you ready, Rico? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've been, I've not been to Missouri in, um, I want to say, uh, fourteen, fifteen years. But um, you know, big shout out, man. Big shout out to Missouri. How they're doing it. I got to go out there and visit and see what's popping out there. Does anybody know like how good the product is in the Show Me State? Do not. I mean, it's good enough for people to buy. People are buying it. Yeah, make him a you go. Dollars. Go with Jason oh, Beck. That way, it'll be the best weed in the world. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. Full proof plan. Out. Yes, indeed. So, thank you all for joining us for yet another episode of High Nine News. You can catch us live weekdays, nine a.m. Pacific, high noon on the East Coast. Big shout out to the super fans showing love, getting their comments mm -hmm. posted live on the big screen, and. um Sorry, my screen just went went blank. Getting their uh, comments live on the big screen and online supporters catching us across all media platforms tuning in each day to the headlines of chaos, also known as the developing cannabis industry. Our vetted correspondent team tuning in from all over, bringing us much needed variety of perspective and your respected opinions to the table. Production team, cloud media partners, all the sponsors, keeping our lights on and AV struggles to a minimum. And, uh, you know, uh, Adam, uh, is Adam back there today, Jason? Are you, you know, yeah, no, yeah, no, no, yeah. No, no, is he I'm, feathering? Adam, feathering? Adam, 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 had to go. I'm over here. I'm Looking like a young John Travolta. I love it. And as always, <laughs> Canada, <laughs> <Eva> L. <laughs>
<laughs> the reason the Hyatt Nine News team reads these headlines every single day, thank you too. It has been Thursday, March 28th, 2024. The show's over. You've all been blessed with the top industry headlines. Make sure you guys support local business, support the cannabis industry, the people that you love, the legacy players, and support these events. Too. We've got a big one coming out here uh, this weekend. Uh, support Rochelle and, and uh, out at uh, um, the Not Hippie Hill event <laughs> over there. Uh, um, and um, everybody else doing shit too, man. Uh, my name is Rico Lamit, the dopest dad on the street for Hot Nine News, the cannabis industry's number one daily news show. And uh, uh, we give it a we give it a Stone Slate today. How about that? Stone Slate. Thanks, what you got Rico. for you? Thank man? you, buddy. When life gets you down. Take a breather, take a puff, and then dive back in. Thank you guys for watching. Always, I'll see you next week. Yes, sir. My hat is red. Red is red. <laughs>